All right. We'll go ahead and get started, Anthony. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us at the library. Um, we are going to do a presentation tonight about the fly fishing capital of the world, Roscoe, and of course about the Fly Fishing Museum. Um, and we are so thankful to have Anthony here from the Fly Fishing Museum, and he can talk to us about all of that. Um, just as a, a reminder, those of you that have been here before know when you come in, you, we put you on mute, but um, Anthony, if he has anything, he'll ask you to raise your hand and we will unmute you. Uh, we'll also have the chat open in case anybody has a question. Um, we can also, you know, get to you that way as well. Um, but at the end, well, I'm sure we'll have time for questions as well. So, um, I'll turn it over to you, Anthony. Excellent. Um, so uh, thank you for, for having us um, or having me in this case. Uh, my name is Anthony Mangardino. Um, I sit on the board of directors of the Catskill Fly Fishing Museum, hello Denise. And um, I am not only the chair of the archives and the collection committee, but I also sit as treasurer. Um, I've been coming up, I'm actually speaking to you right now from Westchester County, New York. Um, I've been coming up to the Catskills since I'm a kid, probably around 13 years old, and um, I actually got involved with fly fishing just by pure luck. Um, I'm one of four boys. Uh, my mother and father uh, were basically looking for an avenue to allow us to kind of run wild, so to speak, and uh, took us up to the Catskills, and we bought a small uh, log cabin in Horton, New York, and um, my brothers and I... Um, got involved with a lot of the local things that were going on between hunting and, and obviously the fly fishing. The fly fishing came to me by the owner of the log home. Um, he was a senior gentleman who was an Air Force Two uh, fighter pilot. And um, he was just amazed that there was four boys moving into his house that had no idea what fly fishing was all about. My father and mother were from the Bronx, so fly fishing was something that they were not um, You've been accustomed to fishing, yes, but not fly fishing. So with that, myself and uh, one of my other brothers kind of got involved. And um, I'm sure that gentleman has um, moved on, so to speak. But um, I think he's probably pleased with the fact that he actually um, got someone else uh, as involved as I am in the sport, which is basically the emphasis of fly fishing. Not many kids today are, are born with the knowledge of the sport. And um, we try to mentor as, as many people as possible, specifically the youth at the, uh, the Catskill Museum. So just curious, and I can't see everybody, but I can see Marvin and I can see Denise. I was just wondering if you all know about the museum up in Livingston Manor. Um, so if you could raise your hands to let me know yes or no, okay? And have any of you actually visited it? The museum. Oh, you have. Excellent. So with that said, the museum itself is a special place. Um, I'm very familiar with Monticello as well. I've spent a lot of time there. Um, but in respects to the, the Catskills, uh, most of my time is up in Roscoe, New York or Livingston Manor, which is probably about well, about 15, 20 minutes, if not 30 minutes north of Monticello. With that said, um, the museum is a very special place. What you have in Sullivan County is is not just a very famous fly fishing spot. You actually have a world renowned spot in regards to uh, the legendary, legendary water that, that encompasses the area. Um, there are probably seven different rivers in your region or in the Catskill, specifically in Roscoe, the most famous river being the Beaverkill. And then there's another river which runs within to the Beaver Kills uh, flow called the Willow Weemock, which runs out of Livingston Manor. Those two rivers alone um, probably have more written about them um, within the literature of the of fly fishing throughout the world than any two rivers. Um, then you obviously have the Delaware and the Sopus and, and many other rivers in the area. So what I can tell you about the museum was it was started back in 1985 as a thought by some of the famous families um, that were located in Roscoe. Um, when, I, when I tell you that the area is not one of these places that when you mention, even if you were international and you happen to bump into a fly fisherman or a fly fisherwoman and mention um, that you come from your area, they would 
actually probably fall on their knee, their knees to know that you are actually from that area. It is considered the mecca of fly fishing throughout the world. It is on everybody's bucket list to at one point or another visit and fish, fish the fisheries of the Catskills. Um, there's a lot of history and it's broken into a lot of different pieces. Um, there's actually the conservation aspect of it when they were building Route 17. And a lot of the local um, people in, in the area that actually had no background whatsoever when it came to law were able to fight to make sure that the rivers stayed pristine. And um, then there's other avenues in regards to the sport itself, which is the very famous fly tires of Roscoe, which is families uh, with names like the Deddies and the Darbies. Um, and then also the legendary uh, fly fishermen themselves that that have, you know, uh, blessed the waters and have written a lot of books about it. Out of any sport in, in this country, including golf, no sport has had as many books written about it as fly fishing. So it's kind of this very small niche. If you look at fishing and you think of it as a pyramid, the bottom of that pyramid where it's as wide as can be is, is basically what most of us have grown up with in conventional fishing for bass and things like that. The top of that pyramid is the tip, the, the smallest point at the tip is, is basically the fly fishing aspect of it. But it's so historic in your area that, um, that it, it's actually, you know, um, got to the point where a museum was actually formed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop now and I'm going to run a video that we've uh, created just so you get a little bit of information about the area and the fly fishing. And towards the end of it, after the video runs, there's going to be some slides that I might pause just to explain what they are and who the people are. Um, and then from that point forward, we can probably um, break out and, and have some uh, uh, questions and answers at that point. So I'm going to run the video now. I'm just going to share the screen. Hopefully everybody can see that. Jonathan, can you see that? Yes, sir. I think water has always been restorative for people, whether you're in an ocean, a lake, a stream, or a river. It's always had the capacity to balance things out. I think water makes you feel like there is a power much greater than you because of that incredible natural asset that's been so well maintained. There's a uniqueness to the Catskill region, and I, I think that we have to have respect for that. on the Beaver Kill River in the Catskills, the birthplace of dry fly fishing in America. It's a healthy environment. The waters are clean, and that's one of the wonderful things about fly fishing. You only fly fish in clean water. Springtime is one of the most beautiful times to be here. Blossoms and trees and the fish are hungry and vibrant. Insects are hatching. It's a glorious time to be a street. We have a community of fishing leaders and legends that make their home here because of the richness and bounty of the fishery. The Fly Fishing Center and Museum is an incredible homage to what was done here over 150 years ago and still can be done today. The museum is located here because we are in the epicenter of fly fishing in the Catskills. There is a deep, deep tradition of fly fishing here. The museum is really there to preserve that history and at the same time introduce people to the sport of fly fishing in a number of different ways. The museum began really as a grassroots organization and we've grown to be worldwide, but it really began with the people that lived here, the people that love these rivers and wanted to see that history preserved. And that is still true today. There are many people, the different fly tires, the rod makers that work locally and worldwide to keep the center operating.
Fly fishing is just a beautiful sport from the places you can fish to the rods that are made to the flies that are tied. And it's really just perpetuating that to keep that spirit going. There's a thrill to it. There's the expectation, the anticipation of connecting on a thin line and, and feeling the integrity of an animal on the other end that you're connected with, sometimes for a brief moment, sometimes for minutes on end. But that's really a joy. That's a connection with a wild that is one of the most satisfying parts of fly fishing. Let me see if I could just expand this a little bit more to everybody. So basically, um, give me one second here. If you can see, um, let me just go backwards a little bit because my screen is all discombobulated right now. So generally, these folks that are here in this picture, um, let me go back a little bit. I apologize. Are a very famous family, um, and their name is Darby. And this is Elsa and, and Harry Darby. Now, Elsa was actually the brainchild of the museum. She was le um, legitimately the first president of the museum, but she passed away before the museum actually opened. But her family still resides in Roscoe. Her daughter um, is involved with... Um, the local library and also carries on the family name in regards to a lot of their legacy. Um, but this is one of the families in Roscoe that, that became world renowned for their fly tying. So fly fishing has a, a lot of different uh, aspects to it. It's similar to golf. It has a short game and it has a long game and it has a putting game. Um, one of the things you have to learn when you go fly fishing is entomology. I mean, walking into the rivers of the Catskills, where they are freestone rivers, which get their supply of water from snow melt, uh, rain, and also the natural springs, there is a purity to the river that allows um, a whole life to, um, or a life cycle to happen beneath the water, which is the aquatic life. And that's what the fish eat, or at least in this case, the trout. And you need to get some sort of knowledge of that entomology. Um, most of the bugs have three different stages in their life. Um, the beginning stages is what they call their nymph stages, which they survive underwater. Um, some for a few uh, months, some a year, some it takes years for them then to develop into the next stage, uh, which is the emerging stage where they actually raise to the top and eventually change their, um, their whole um, um, shape in regards to what they look like by growing or actually hatching from a case and, and growing a, an actual pair of wings. And, and then that is called the emerging stage, which they turn to what we call duns, bugs with wings that then tend to fly off into the bushes. And then again, it changes um, either that same day or, the, or a few days later where the bugs then obviously mate females lay their eggs and the cycle of life begins again. But during the duration of this whole cycle, which we call instars, um, the fish are feeding. And there is a saying in a book written called matching the hatch, which is extremely important in the world of fly fishing to understand because you need to know what they're actually eating. And depending where you are in the country, it all changes. So if you were to fish in Pennsylvania where the waters are different, they're limestone, they're more acidic, they have a different um, bug population, mostly what we call scud, which are kind of like shrimp-like bugs. So fly fishing is one of these sports where you can go on a lifetime learning about the different waters, the different fisheries, the different aquatic life. Then it breaks out even different. You can be very artistic and want to be one who ties their own flies. And the Catskills, again, as the Darbies, there's also another family named the Deddies. Um, and a lot of in-between people like Rube Cross, um, Ed Hewitt, these are all people that, that were during what we call the golden age of fly fishing. 
that developed the patterns we use today to fly fish. And that was probably around the early to mid um, 20th century. Um, that is when fly fishing really exploded on the scene in regards to popularity and in regards to all the different what we call patterns that we use today to fly fish. And then it even breaks out even further to the rods that we use. The original rods that, that carried over from England were made out of wood. They were then um, transferred into um, uh, bamboo, which is extremely popular till still today. And there's been a lot of what we call bamboo rod makers that came from the New York area, stretching from pretty much Westchester um, all the way up towards, um, you know, the border of Canada, where we have had very famous rod builders make these beautifully designed bamboo rods that in most cases take 100 hours to actually make. And then modern technology caught up. Fiberglass came out, graphite, and there's a whole, you know, a selection of different types of fly rods that you can use today in the different types of fishing um, that you're doing. So uh, fly fishing is one of these sports that honestly, um, and I've, I can attest to it, is an education almost on a daily in regards to the different types of technologies and, and uh, casting methods and what have you. But the cat skills is basically where it was centered. And the original um, person that is responsible for that, which we consider where you know, if you heard the video, it's at the birthplace of uh, dry fly fishing in America. That was Joan Wolf, who's another famous um, fly fisherman in the Catskills. But she actually was uh, married to another uh, to a gentleman named Lee Wolf. And together they were extremely um, popular in the world of fly casting. Um, Joan was actually a tournament caster and won many tournaments and her husband Lee, who was from the area, um, was known to uh, pilot a small little airplane throughout um, Northern New York into Canada. And he, would, he was basically a bush pilot. He would just land a plane on a stretch of water that he happened to see and start fishing that water. So they are very unique in their own way, but they became very famous to the point where they actually opened up a casting school, which is still running today. Uh, in Lou Beach, which is not far from Roscoe, uh, maybe within five or 10 miles of, of Roscoe. So, I mean, it just, it, I can continue to tell you the stories and the traditions and the families and the people all involved, but the Catskills is, is considered an extremely important part. And the gentleman who is responsible for all of it, his name is Theodore Gordon. Now, Theodore Gordon was an English man who came to America very well off uh, but he was an unhealthy individual. He lived in Manhattan and um, he actually um, had some illnesses that were probably best to uh, come north to the Catskill Mountains. And he decided to live a very um, reclusive life and concentrate on the fishery. The only issue is was fly fishing was not one that was popular at the time in America. And he had to contact some of his friends in England to ask them what he should do. Unfortunately, the rivers in England and the rivers in America are different, but there was a gentleman named Frederick Colford who sent him a selection of flies and said, maybe you should try using these. And what Theodore Gordon is very famous for is the fact that he took those patterns and realized that they are different than the American flies, and he transitioned them into the patterns we use today. So he is considered really the godfather of fly fishing or dry fly fishing in America. And again, that all started in the Catskill region. So with that said, um, the museum itself was opened in 1995. L.C. Darby was the first president of the museum. And basically the mission of the museum is to protect and safeguard the, um, the history and uh, of the past, the present and the future of fly fishing. So over the years, we've had many donations of a lot of different types of items that are very integral in, in the history of fly fishing that we have a museum that we exhibit these in. Now, besides the exhibit, um, as chair of the archives, we also have a collection that's in storage that we rotate from time to time of thousands of items that are historic. And this all um, is encompassed in the Fly Fishing Museum. The museum itself is on 50 acres. And one of the new things that we did or we started this year because of the pandemic was we've opened up um, a lot of the property to have uh, trails for walking. Um, 
we opened that up to the public. It's something that we felt that was an outreach, an outreach to the community where they had a place to come. And even if they weren't involved with fly fishing, they can utilize those trails, walk the dogs. In the winter, a lot of people were snowshoeing and also cross-country skiing. So that's another um, option at the museum that you can do. But the museum itself has what we call a welcome or gift center. It has the museum itself. And then we have another building, which we call the Wolf Gallery, which was donated um, by a lot of generous uh, members to um, encompass a lot of what the wolves, and that was Lee and Joan Wolf had in their collections. And then beneath it, we actually have a working bamboo rod shop, which we call the Garrison Carmichael workshop. And that is a actual bamboo rod, rod shop that was donated by Hoagie Carmichael. Um, and generally rod builders will come by from the world and utilize the equipment um, and build their rods. So. It's the type of place that you can come, spend a couple hours, and learn a lot of history of the area. And with that said, um, you know, you you generally it is. I'm just going to clear out my screen here. Give me one second because I want to go back to a full screen here. Um, you are lucky to be in the area that you are at because you're not very far from um, the museum. And, you know, like I said, it is the type of place that is, is open, um, specifically starts April 1st, and we basically close around November. But it's the type of place that you can come and really learn about the area and the cast of characters that have made, you know, an impact in the world of fly fishing. Um, and that's about it. So from this point, you know, if there's any questions, Jonathan, that I can answer, I'd be more than happy to do that as well. Okay, let me take you off of screen sharing here. Real yeah, quick. If you could do that. Um, there you go. Um, does anyone have any questions? I'll go ahead and um, allow folks to unmute um, if they have. I just, just before you get going, I saw a, a, um, a question come in via the chat about Hoagie Carmichael. <clears throat> And uh, Hoagie Carmichael, um, he is the son of the Hoagie Carmichael songwriter that you're thinking of. Um, so Hoagie Carmichael um, no, he, he he was, um, was actually, you know, born in Beverly Hills, lived with his dad. He'd tell you crazy stories in regards that he would wake up every morning, go into his living room and you know, Humphrey Bogart would be sitting there having a discussion with his dad. But Hoagie got involved in fly fishing again, similar to me. He was kind of introduced by accident and he was a golfer by 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 trade or love, however you put it. And uh, the fly fishing bug caught him and he became a very um, not only famous fly fisherman, but he also authored many books um, that are cherished in the in the world of fly fishing right now. Um, so yeah, Hoagie is involved with the museum. He donates a lot of equipment. And as I mentioned, he's the son of, of who you're thinking about in regards to the songwriter. Do you, do you have any idea how many people participate in fly fishing on a national basis? Is it only in the Northeast sort of where we are? No. Or is it out in Colorado and everywhere? Wyoming? Yeah, so pretty much wherever water flows, you'll find fly fishermen. I think the Northeast um, is the most, most historic aspect of the fly fishing. So everybody tends to make some sort of trip to specifically the Catskills in this case to fish these waters. But Colorado is an extremely popular fishery. Montana is even more so. Um, and then there's a couple of different schools of fly fishing. So in the case uh, of what we're talking about right now is, is freshwater fly fishing. But if you go down south, specifically Florida, there's the saltwater fly fishing, which is a completely different game. Um, obviously, the bugs are bigger, the, the, the bounty or the fish you're catching are bigger. Um, so fly fishing itself, I really couldn't put a number on it as far as, you know, viable people that, that are part of it. I would imagine it's in the millions, but I could tell you it's, it's pretty much in every state as long as there's, you know, a fishery that's, that's viable. Thank you. Do you know how many people come through the museum in a given year? 
So basically the way the museum works, I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to put a number on it this year, obviously, because we were closed most of the year. So this was a very hard year for us. It was actually the year that I took on the position as treasurer. So, you know, that was right before the pandemic hit and uh, it was an interesting year to operate and try to navigate through. But for the most part, I would, I would have to say it's in the thousands um, of people. I'm, I'm going to probably say um, from the beginning of, from the beginning of April to to when we closed the museum in November, I would cons I would think at least I would say between three and five thousand people will probably come through that the museum's property. I can't say they all come in the actual museum itself, uh, but we do work with Trout Unlimited and a lot of other organizations. And what they do is they have on the property some of their meetings. And they'll meet up as a group, have lunch, and then they'll, they'll fish uh, the local fishery or even the water that's on the river. The Willow Weemock actually runs through the property, and that's uh, accessible to all the members or any guests that are on the property. Anthony, we had someone ask, what kind of fish can you catch? Okay, so the Catskills are specifically um, what we consider trout. Um, there are three types of trout. Um, that are resident in the Catskills. The original trout, the trout that 100 years ago, fishermen from the city used to come fish or the locals would fish is called brook trout. Um, but it actually isn't a, a trout. It's actually what we consider a char. But due to the fact that it's part of the, the, the trio, it's, it's considered the brook trout. The other two trout that are prominent in the area, one being what we call the brown trout and the other being the rainbow trout. These trout did not um, originate from the area. The brown trout actually came from Europe. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, stories in regards to how they actually entered the water. And the same thing with the rainbow trout. The issue is that each trout has a different um, feeding habit. So the brown trout are probably the most aggressive of all the trout that are in the river and they are dominant. So as a fly fisherman, I can tell you my favorite trout to catch would be an actual brook trout and they don't come very large unless you go way up north um, almost on the border of Canada with it where you can find them in lakes and, and they're in the pounds but in the beaver kill if you can catch a brook trout it's usually between I would say six and nine inches but they are the most beautiful of all the trout it actually looks like God has taken a paintbrush and and painted every spot on that trout but because they're not as aggressive as the brook trout Oh, excuse me, the brown trout, the brown trout have overpopulated the area uh, due to the fact that they're they're just more of an aggressive fish in regards to their feeding. And the rainbow trout are beautiful, too, because they actually have like a rainbow pattern on the sides of their bodies. They have a pink cheek. Um, and when you catch them, they're very um, aerobatic. They jump out of the water. But those are the three fish that you're going to catch in the in the Catskill fishery. Um, to, throughout the country, that changes. A lot of rivers have have bass in them, uh, smallmouth, largemouth bass, pike. But the rivers themselves in the Catskills are mainly just the, those three classifications of trout. It means health and safety measures have met rigorous scientific standards. Somebody asked if the museum has a website, and they do. If you Google the Catskill Fly Fishing Museum, it'll come up. I think it's www.cffcm.com. And that, that website was actually redone this year. It actually does feature the video you just watched as well. As far as the, there's another question here. Uh, what were the names of the families in Roscoe? So as far as Roscoe is concerned, the families that are most famous are the Darby's and the Deddies. Those are the two most famous uh, fishing families in, in the actual <clears throat> Roscoe area. Now the Deddies, their shop is still open. It's the oldest fly shop in America. It's over 80 years old and it's gone through multiple generations um, it went from the Deddies themselves to their daughter, and now it's to the great grandson. And his name is not Deddy. His last name is actually Fox. But Joe Fox is running the Deddy Fly Shop, and he is so the the original shop is in Roscoe. It's still there, but he's expanded into Livingston Manor. And there's a shop that he sits in in Livingston Manor, right in the main village, that um, that has you know that is a Deddy um, Fly Shop and and carries the traditions and, and the style of type that the tying that they've done because he's learned it from his grandmother. 
Anthony, can I just ask, I, I know you've talked about flies and I know there are different kinds of flies. Um, I'm sure there's a price range from like a basic one to like a, a, a more, you know, advanced one is what is that kind of price range is? So, so basically fly fishing in general is inexpensive when it comes to the fly. So a lot of people who are involved in fly fishing do everything themselves. I can't say they build their own rods, but there are a lot of people who do that. Um, but the rods and the reels are probably your most expensive aspect of fly fishing. But that doesn't mean it has to be expensive. You can get starter rods like I had for probably and the reel for under, you know, $150. And you could learn how to, you know, start start casting and, and reading all the different books. But one of the things I can tell you is Roscoe specifically has about a half a dozen fly shops that during the fly fishing season run a lot of free clinics. And the museum does too. So what we do with those fly shops is they utilize our property for their um, customers to run fly clinics. And then we ask them to run a few fly, fly clinics for our membership. So if you go on the website, specifically on a normal year, you would see a calendar full of those type of weekends where you can come and actually uh, take a free clinic. Um, but as far as the flies are concerned, if you were to have somebody or if you went into the Roscoe fly shops and bought their flies, they're probably in the range of $2 to $2.50 a fly. If you were to tie those flies, it would be pennies. Um, and a lot of fly fishermen do fly their, tie their own flies, and that is done generally during the winter where people aren't fly fishing. Fly fishing. Um, so in that aspect of it, the, the sport is, you know, it's really relatively not a very expensive sport other than the main components. You could spend thousands of dollars on the actual rod and reel if you, if you choose so, but you don't have to. And then there's obviously the, the, um, the clothing that you would need. So, you know, there are some people who believe in what we call wet wading, which is basically they wear a pair of shorts and sandals and they actually walk into the river specifically when the water warms up. And they, they basically fish with, you know, just that on. And then there's the fly fishermen like myself who actually have what we call waders, which are, I guess the best way to put it are rubber pants, so to speak. And you could walk into the rivers and not worry about getting wet. And, um, you know, there's just little intricacies like that, that over the years you accumulate and you buy them once, really, to be honest with you. I'm probably using the same waders for the past 10 years. Um, but like I said, I mean, it's the type of thing that if you do get involved with, you'll start to see there's there's many schools that you might get interested in because there's that much to to really kind of educate yourself on within the sport. And a lot of that is is in the museum. So although I'm speaking about the sport mainly, I, I do want to emphasize the fact that if you did come to the museum for a visit, you would get a good understanding of what I'm talking about in one nutshell. You know, under that roof, there is pretty much everything I'm speaking about, kind of with um, descriptive cards explaining exactly what it's all, you know, um, about and giving you a little bit of a history lesson. Catskills was originally famous for different kind of waiters. <laughs> what? W A I T E R S. Okay. In, in, in the dining rooms. Yeah, I got you. When the resorts were around, I hear you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but there's, you know, I got to be honest with you, not to make this a Catskill type conversation. I do definitely see a renaissance, specifically in that area, Roscoe and, and Livingston Manor. I know at one time there was thousands of uh, resorts in the areas back in the 40s and maybe the 50s, 60s, maybe 70s. I'm but I'm, I'm starting to see a lot of that happen again, where, you know, these young couples are coming up from the city or where have you. And they're, they're kind of buying properties. And, and there's one family, um, I think they're called the Foster Supply. It's the Sims. And um, they probably uh, renovated close to seven different um, old B&Bs and kept them traditional and yet reopened them with a more sophisticated type of um, um, clientele in regards to like the fact that you know, their kitchens are, you know, pushing out, you know, really incredible types of meals. So, um, you know, I see a lot going on in the Casco, specifically the last few years, but mainly last year, I've seen a huge push as much as you wouldn't think that would happen um, during the course of COVID. But I think there's been a lot of uh, interest in the Casco. So I could tell you that. 
that could be a good thing or a bad thing. You know, it depends on, you know, how you look at it. But, um, you know, growing up in the area, I've seen the area myself change a lot from good to bad to the middle ground. But I've always enjoyed the area. And I have three daughters myself. And one of the things I was happy, most happy about was actually being able, um, I built a house in Roscoe uh, 15 years ago. And for at least eight of those years, they spent most of their summers there. So they got a good idea of, of, you know, what that lifestyle was like. Does anyone else have a question? You, you said about the, uh, the the clinics. How do we find out about the uh, the clinics again? Where where do we go to? Um, so if you go on to the yeah, if you go onto the Catskill Fly Fishing Museum's website, um, there is a calendar of events. I have to you know make you aware that the events. This is the first since last year, the first season where we've actually starting to have events again, specifically outside. I do not know how many clinics um, we have set up for this season, uh, for the 2021 season, but I would tell you to do this. Um, the Deddy Fly Shop and another shop called the Catskill Flies, which is um, you know, <laughs> in Roscoe. And there's also an Orvis shop in, in Roscoe. Those three shops will run clinic, free clinics on the weekend. I do know that that Orvis shop does it because I, I see them casting in their parking lot most of the time or the grass lot that's that runs, um, you know, uh, alongside of their shop. But those three shops, if you go onto their websites and I don't have them handy, but if you Google them, you'll find them. You can find um, them. Yeah. How, how do you spell that? Uh, the Deddy? How do you spell that? So Deddy is spelled D-E-T-T-E -T -T -E, fly shop. Okay. And like I said, it's it's being run mainly out of Livingston Manor right now. Um, that's your most historic fly shop. And then there's the Catskill fly shop, which is in Roscoe. And that recently just got a new owner because the, the past owner who was very involved with the museum passed. And then his wife was running the shop and she passed. So there's a new owner there. His name is Joe He's a very nice guy and he's doing the same thing. And then there's the Orvis shop, um, in Roscoe. I mean, I you could, how do you spell that? O R. Yeah, O R V I S, but I think it's it's actually his name is the Beaver Kill Angler, and that shop's owner's name is Evan, who sits on the board of directors of the museum. And I can tell you that I still receive a lot of his emails. He runs clinics uh, during the season on the weekly. So if you go on all those websites, you'll find something. Oh, okay. And is your museum open now because of the COVID to, you know, yeah. to, uh, to visitors? Yeah. Right. So we've opened to the public. Our, our normal business hours are basically uh, we open Friday through Monday at this stage of the game. We'll open up more, but basically Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, we're fully open to the public. You can visit the museum, the gift shop, the welcome center, uh, walk the property. The trails are open all day, all night seven days a week. So you can actually um, take a ride over to the property and walk the trails anytime you want. Um, and then as the season progresses and as we watch this, you know, the, the I guess you would say the COVID protocol, so to speak, will will entertain opening more days during the week. But generally those days are the most active because that's when a lot of people are actually out and about fly fishing is, is those weekend days and including Monday. Are there, are there tours of the museum? In other words, you know, take us through the museum and give us, you know, kind of like a, an overview of, uh, you know, kind of the, some of the ins and outs and, you know, you know, particulars that we should pay attention to and be well, interested in? Right now, the museum doesn't have any official tours. The museum is opened and the museum was just recently um, redone by a by actually the vice president of the museum, who is an actual um uh, art gallery director and also museum um, uh, curator in the city. And he's basically set up the museum now where someone like yourself or anyone listening to this, um, um, this presentation could walk in and he's got it set up where you can actually walk step by step, have that information um, privy to you. So you can read exactly what you're looking about and uh, or looking at, and understanding what it's all about at this time um, we do not have tour guides to answer your question but at times i am asked personally 
to meet groups there and, and walk them through, which, you know, I do not have a problem doing. Um, but usually that's with like groups like uh, the Trout Unlimited or fly fishing clubs that can get a group of five or 10 people where we can walk through the museum. And if there's any anything I can give them information on, I try to do that. Um, but right now, uh, for the year 2021, if you were to walk into the museum, you would kind of be on your own, but you would be guided by um, what has been created by this curator that we have with us at this time. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think you just answered part of my question. Huh. Um, I have the only children's group under Sullivan 180, if you're familiar with him. Okay. So I take over. And uh, last year, I was going to ask Judy Van Putt if she would show us about, you know, the flies and, sure. and, and fishing. And I wanted to bring them to the Fly Fishing Museum. Sure. Uh, but if you don't really have tours, and these children are like seventh, eighth and ninth graders at this right. point. So uh, I mean, basically on something, I know Judy pretty well, um, or I should say very well. I know Ed as well. Um, over the years, um, I Judy might not be the person that you need to to um, to speak about that with. You can talk to me directly or in within the staff at the museum. Uh, there's a young lady named Jill who if if you could tell us, you know, when you wanted to make a visit, the amount of people in the group, um, myself or someone else would meet you there and walk you through the um, uh, the actual museum and give a tour. Like, as I mentioned, as long as it's structured in that capacity, I have no problem doing that myself. So if you want, um, I don't know the best way to do it. I don't know if maybe Jonathan can send everybody an email, but I can actually give you my email address. And anybody on this call who's interested to do something as you are looking to do, um, I'd be more than happy to communicate with you and set that up. OK, thank you. Yeah. Um, Anthony, I can put your email in the chat here. OK, you have it, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Get something here. Um, yeah, because uh, I was going to, I know Judy, uh, only through church. Yep. And um, uh, so I was going to ask her, you know, like if we could actually go down to the water and she'd explain stuff, you know, because these are kids. But yep. I also wanted to go to the museum because I want to introduce, these are uh, first generation children of immigrants. And okay. I want to introduce them you know, to this area and what, you know, what is available and available to their parents and, you know, um, and, and because it's also part of Sullivan 180's health. Yeah, gotcha. Well, one of the things I can, I can let you in on is um, moving forward, probably starting towards the end of a, um, I, a starting at the end of May, um, one of the initiatives I wanted to start with the museum is opening up the demographics of the membership, meaning uh, we are an educational based institution. So we do have a lot of uh, different young youth that come from the Boy Scouts uh, to some of the local schools. But I feel that um, there is a group or many groups that we are not reaching. Um, and to some degree, we want to open up, um, I guess, our reach to that community, one being um, those that that generally do not have the access, uh, those that are of minorities, um, those that are of, you know, um, of color that generally would generally not have that opportunity to be part of, of what we offer at the museum. Um, so that is something that I'm looking to start um, basically at the end of May of next year, I should say this year. Um, so I would be actually interested in communicating with you about that. Oh, okay. I'll take your address and, uh, E email you because yeah, I email you know, and, and we'll discuss it because it's definitely something, you know, I don't want to get too much into it and sound politically correct or incorrect. But even, you know, one of the things that you got to remember about fly fishing is we even have a lot of women involved. And it's kind of weird in, in the year 2021 that we would actually even utilize those those names and categories, but women have become very famous and have always become or were very famous in the world of fly fishing. Uh, one of the women that you saw there, Joan Wolf, as I mentioned, is, is, a, you know, is more legendary than probably any um, male angler uh, that's in the sport. Judy Van Putt is another one. I mean, obviously her husband has his own legacy in, re in writing many books and he was part of um, a lot of the conservation in the area. Besides, he's a very well-known and renowned fly tire. 
but Judy herself um, is an extremely um, capable fly fisherman. So, um, you know, that's something that I've been looking to, to really expand on with the museum in the upcoming year is, is getting more women involved and obviously getting more, um, you know, um, demographics that generally wouldn't have the access to the museum in regards to um, whatever the case may be. It could be inner city, any city kid, inner city kids or, or whatever it is um, involved in the sport. And, and you'd be amazed to see how many of them actually really take to it. Yeah, these are, you know, all children from Liberty at this point in time. Um, but um, and I, I'm familiar with Joan Wolf because I've done a lot of reading on the area and I do yeah. genealogy and I read Judy's column every week. Yeah. I don't fly fish. <laughs> But I mean, every other week, I think she's in the Democrat now. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, Judy, Judy, actually, many moons ago when I was looking to sell my property and she was actually my realtor at the time. So I, I know Judy for a long time. So yeah, she's I've only a, known her the past three or four years. Yeah. So, uh, it's, it's kind of amazing on my behalf because I'm not a Catskill, you know, resident in any respect. I never, you know, I just spent my summers there, but I was able to... Um, really connect with a lot of, of the local folk and, and over the years just became very um, um, acclimated to the area, but more so with the people. So it's kind of funny that, you know, I probably know more people in the Catskills than I do actually in Westchester. So. Anthony, I, I know I should know because I live here, but um, when does fly fishing season officially start? April 1. Oh, yeah, April 1st. How could you miss it? <laughs> April 1, April Fool's Day, because you think you're going to catch and you never do anyway on April 1. Did a, so. did a fi are the fish aware of that date? Uh, oh, you say that again? Are the fish aware that it's April 1st is the date? The, uh, the fish? Date? Yeah, the fish. Do they know? They must be, they must be because I don't think I've ever caught a fish on April 1st in my <laughs> life. Not you even know, a two-headed one, right? Exactly. So that's very good that you mentioned that. So where... Where the Willow Weemock River and the Beaver Kill uh, meet in Roscoe is called Junction Pool. And there's a fabled story about a two headed trout um, that didn't know if it should wander up the Willow Weemock or the Beaver Kill because they actually joined there. So it grew two heads. And, and there's actually dinners in the area that, that, that are named after that. Um, so there's just a lot of fun stuff and historic stuff. And, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely a sport that, you know, it's, it's one of the few things that I'm actually extremely interested and passionate about. But the museum is very important to me because um, I'm just very much involved with trying to safeguard the, the past, specifically a lot of these people that we were just talking about tonight, um, even in my own house. This is my house that I'm speaking to you from now. And as you can see from behind me, I, you know, I just cherish a lot of the um, the um, the old items or collections, so to speak, in regards to um what it represents so that's funny because i i thought you were in the museum when i'm looking many, at that stuff i said oh he's in the museum now nah, <laughs> many many people my, many people do believe that they they actually say oh you're at the museum i'm like no nah, i'm actually at my house the museum is 10 times has 100 times more than what you see behind me and, and my stuff actually if i shifted it goes throughout my whole basement but this is honestly i've been collecting since you know collecting a lot of stuff since i'm like 13 i'm i'm 49 now i'm turning 50 in may so it's a lot of years of of keeping the stuff and, and treasuring it. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm from, uh, I'm from Long Island and ah. uh, there's a, uh, you know, we, we come past this, we come past your museum all the time and uh, we've never stopped there, but every time, because my, my wife is from Buffalo and we'll drive up, you know, past there and we keep, we always see the sign for the fly fishing museum. Yep. So, yeah. So I, every year I go, we, we got to stop there. We got to stop there. You should. So my wife yeah. said to me, "Tell you so now you you get to you get to see them online here. You zoom and see see if it's a worthwhile you know place place to go to. But for years we've been going by there and we see we see the sign for the place. Well, what's amazing is where that sign is. If if you turn right off where that sign is and go down the hill, you'd be at the museum. 
Wow. But unfortunately, we don't have access off of 17 there. So you'd actually have to get off at Livingston Manor and then swing back around and we're probably a couple of miles up the road. But we're actually it's kind of funny because where that sign is, we're right like That's 100 funny. feet below it. It's just it's kind of a, and supposedly there's an easement there for emergency vehicles. But I, I don't know if that's the case. Am I speaking to you? Are you in Long? Is that where you reside is Long Island? Yes. Yes. So I, you, I, I reside on Long Island. Yes. So do you have a home upstate? No, no, no. My, my wife, my wife is from Buffalo. Oh, yeah. So we, so we, you know, we'll go up there like over the summer. She has relatives up there. Right, gotcha. we'll, we'll go up there. And I, I see that. We see, I always see that sign, you know, it's, it's yep. a funny thing for years. We, we got to stop there. We got to stop there. But, you know, we're always, it's a big trip from Long Island up there. So we're like, all right, all right, you know, next time. But uh, this is, this, I, I have a question for you. You know, there, there's a guy down here on, on Long Island and he does, um, he does like different video presentations. But one of the things that he does is he does virtual tours of museums. Sure. Like there's, like there's a Donna Reed museum yeah. and, uh, uh, you know, a Lucy Museum, all, all these museums and all that. I, I can pass along your name and your email address to him. And if you want, he'll be in contact with you if you'd want to do a virtual presentation. Now, he gets an audience of about 80 people when at least when he does his uh, virtual wow. tours of Absolutely. museums. So this this might be like, a, you know, I see there's only like uh, I'm seeing on my screen right now. There's only like 10 or 11 people like watching this right yeah. now. But this might give you like a nice exposure. His sure. name is uh, Sal St. George. And I'll get in touch with him and I'll pass pass his uh, your email along to him. And, and maybe he'll reach out to you if that would be uh, agreeable to you, if you're interested. Absolutely. It might be a perfect fit, too, because St. Yeah. George happens to be a very famous flywheel that a company called Hardy manufactured out of England. So, yeah, it would actually be a good fit. Some th some things like you know uh, may not be coincidence, right? I I I always believe that destiny is it happens for a reason. So you know it, it's it's but that is something we've been talking about doing the virtual tours. Yeah. But we also are talking about uh, digitize digitizing the museum in a way where. And again, we had to put the brakes on it because of COVID. But God forbid, we were going to go to each exhibit and put um, iPads with the ability of someone to touch and have an interactive experience where they can kind of hear rather than reading what, what the exhibit was about and be able to utilize the iPad. But due to COVID, we obviously had to put the brakes on that because we can't have people touching uh, screens and, and what have you. So it, it's just a crazy time right now. And I think you all can agree to that. So hopefully the sooner we're done with this, the better. Yes. I'll, I'll pass this information uh, along then uh, yeah. and everything to, you know, and get, have you guys be in touch with you because it, this is exactly the type of thing that he does with these virtual tours of the different museums. And, you know, he, he's done them. Um, he goes to museums uh, virtually all over the United States, museums that, that people haven't like your museum that a lot of people are not even familiar with, right. uh, you know, um, like wild bill Hick Hickok, I think it has, has a museum or it's, um, oh. I think, yeah, I believe he had, there's a museum out West someplace like in Montana or well, Buffalo Bill, Buffalo Bill, there's a Buffalo Bill museum. And yeah. so this South St. George, he recently did a tour or virtual tour of the Buffalo Bill Museum. Most people have never heard of that museum and probably most people in the United States have never heard of your museum. And so this would be a nice, this could be nice for both of you. Absolutely. No, I, I, I okay. appreciate that. Sure. Does anyone else have any questions? Thanks very much. It's been very informative. Good. And that is, yeah, that is my email there. So you, you all can take that down and. All right. Well, if anyone has any more questions, feel free to ask, but otherwise um, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. I yeah, just, I just want to make a note in regards to I'm reading the chats on the side. Okay. And, and, um, there's a wo uh, woman named Donna who, who made a mention about um, a group of, of women fly fishermen, women on the fly. Um, so it might be something I, I'll look into them. All right. Well, Anthony, I thank you for coming on with us tonight. I appreciate it. Thanks everyone for joining us as well. Um, and we look forward to seeing you out there in the, the beaver kill.
Yep, absolutely. All right. All right, Denise, I'll look forward for your email too. All right, okay. stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye now.